Hello, and welcome to our very first episode of Into the Woods with Trapping Girl. I am your host, Linda White. Some of you may know me as Trapping Girl. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for tuning in and listening and the support. When you decide to make a podcast, your very first thought is, is anybody going to actually listen to this? So for the five of you that are, I truly appreciate it. (laughs) So um, for those that don't follow me or know who I am, I thought, you know what? This would be a great opportunity to let you know who I am, why I'm doing this podcast, and what to expect for episodes in the future. So let's dive into that. Like I said, my name is Linda White. I am the co-owner of Trapping Girl Inc., co-owner of Sawmill Creek Baits and Lures. I also have a column in the American Trapper called The She Side, which highlights women in trapping. I run a group called Kids for Catches, which helps raise money and give support to kids trapping events throughout the United States. And I also am pro staff for The Real Camo Girl, which highlights women in the outdoors. Now that's all great and grand, but that just tells you where I'm at. That doesn't tell you where it came from. And an outdoor child is not exactly what I would say I was. Uh, My family camped. My brother, my sister, and my parents, we went camping um, probably a handful of times a year. We moved a lot, so, you know, we always had that one camping place that we went back to, but um, our home life, we were either in the city or in rural areas and kind of all over the place. My father moved us around a lot because of his job, which was totally okay. Um, But the camping definitely was something that we enjoyed as a family. My father loved to fish. And in turn, I love my dad. I was a a big daddy's girl growing up as a child. So fishing was definitely something that I wanted to do. I was not the ideal partner, though. Um, And I think that my father kind of kind of liked the fact that as a teenager, I kind of grew out of the fishing thing there for a little while. Um, Because any fishing trip, anytime he wanted to go anywhere, I wanted to go. And like I said, it wasn't the ideal partner. I like to tack a lot, uh, move around, jump around. We had a boat. So, um, yeah, my dad didn't catch a lot whenever I was there. He hunted. And of course, again, because my dad, you know, I wanted to do anything that he was doing. So I wanted to go hunting, too. At the age of 12, he took me squirrel hunting, you know, to try it out, see if this was something that I really wanted to do. Um, We went out. I shot a squirrel square on. My father was ecstatic. You know, first shot, shot this squirrel, hit it. No big deal. Everything was great, grand. Ran over there. I was super excited because my dad was super excited. Saw this squirrel laying on the ground. And I bawled my eyes out. Totally cried. Um, Picked the squirrel up. Me and my father bury it in the backyard. And that was kind of the end of my hunting days. <laughs> my father said to me, you know, sweetheart, I, I'm glad for your enthusiasm, but I don't think you're a hunter. <laughs> He uh, he wasn't going to bury, apparently, a buck in the backyard, so that kind of ended my hunting days. As far as trapping, though, trapping never was anything that my parents ever did. So it was never anything that I even did. You know, as a teenager, I kind of grew out of, I guess, the outdoor stuff. We lived in Erie, Pennsylvania while I was a teenager, and I spent more time, you know, hanging out with my friends, doing all the fun things that you do in a city. And and that was kind of my life until I met my husband. (laughs) Now, my husband lives in Salamanca, New York. Well, we live in Salamanca, New York. And I was living in a townhouse and I worked a corporate job. Um, I think the last time I actually stepped outdoors or did anything outdoorsy uh, probably had been 10 years. 
but I met him and we were on a date and he said, I'm a fisherman, I'm a hunter, and I'm a trapper. And like the whole fishing thing, obviously, I mean, that didn't bother me. My father loved to fish. Um, that was actually one of the reasons that he ended up retiring in Erie, Pennsylvania, because after the his his government job that he had, he then moved on and worked for the fish commission for a while. So, you know, that was that was not a problem. I was all about the whole fishing thing. Hunting still didn't have a problem with it. Uh, we established that it wasn't for me, but um, or at least I thought it wasn't for me. And but I didn't I didn't have an issue. Now, the whole trapping thing. Quite honestly, I had no clue what he was talking about. Um, like I said, trapping wasn't wasn't something that was on my parents' radar, and my father was the most outdoorsy man I knew, um, <laughs> which actually doesn't say much. But um, it just it just wasn't something that I had even really thought about. I wasn't watching Mountain Men. I wasn't you know watching any of your outdoorsy shows or anything like that. So. It just wasn't, it wasn't on my radar. So I said, okay, no problem. And we, you know, kept going, finished the date. Um, I really seemed to like the guy. I thought he was a, a good guy. And I was like most girls do. They they go back and they tell your best friend about, you know, this amazing guy that they met and how much they liked him and how much fun they had. And I told her, you know, he's a, he's a hunter, he's a fisherman, and he's a trapper. and I could see her eyes exploding. I literally watched every anti-trapping thing that was out there. I mean, I had seen anything that, that PETA had put out about hunting, trapping, fishing, all of it. It was just, I watched it all. And that could have been the end right there for me. Um... I wouldn't be doing this podcast. I I wouldn't own the businesses or write the articles that I do. Um, if I would have listened. But for me, it actually shocked me. All the videos, everything that was out there, it shocked me. My parents had always taught me, ask questions. Ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. You know, you're you're not a sheep. You don't just follow blindly into the night. You know, ask questions. And everything that she had shown me made this guy out to be a serial killer. Like, literally was a serial killer. And I thought to myself, you know, I don't think this guy's going to lock me in the basement. Like, I just don't see that. So I... I told him, you know, I was I was going to go up to his house and, and this would have been the perfect serial killer kind of weekend because I was going to go up to his house and I was going to stay the weekend. And um, I got up there and I told him, you know, like, I want to see what this trapping thing's all about. Like, like I got the I got the fishing thing. Not a problem. Um, I know what hunting is. I wasn't doing it at the time because of my experience when I was 12 and thought like, hey, that wasn't for me. Um, but I said to him, I go, I want to see what this trapping thing's all about. And it was funny because you could see that he was just as surprised me asking as I was surprised of myself asking. Um, <laughs> so he said, okay, not a problem. And we went trapping together. I borrowed a pair of his daughter's boots. Um, and we went out trapping and I got in the truck and he said to me, okay, we're going to we're going to do a job. You're going to have a job here. If if this is what we're going to do, you know, there's no free ride. So he gave me this book. And if you've ever trapped, uh, most of you probably keep a log. So he gave me this book and it had everything, you know, you write down what set you're at, what's at the set, have you caught anything, you know, you, you do all that. So he said, okay, you're going to keep this log for me. Um, you're going to make sure we don't miss any traps, you know, and, and okay. So I said, all right, you know, I was an intelligent woman, so I could, I could do this. Not a problem. So I'm writing everything down and we're talking and he's explaining all these things. And as we're going throughout the day, I started kind of 
realizing how much passion he had for this. And if you've ever been around somebody who who like holds a lot of passion for something, who's super excited about something, they get you excited. You don't even know what you're excited about, but they get you excited. Like it could be, you know, like, hey, we're going to rob a bank. Yay, everybody's robbing a bank. No, I mean, but seriously, you get excited. And that's kind of where I was. He went through the entire day and, and he was showing me things and I was asking questions and I was asking questions about things that I had seen, you know, because again, I had seen all the, uh, the PETA propaganda that's out there and, you know, I'd go up and there was an animal in a trap and I was expecting like broken legs and all this other stuff and none of that was happening. Um, you know, and we're, we're talking about all this stuff and it kept me coming back. I kept wanting to see, all right, when does it change? I guess that's kind of what drew me in, you know, he had all this passion for this and this was so exciting for him and you could see how much he loved this. But again, I watched all those videos and I saw all this stuff and I thought to myself, okay, well, when does it change? You know, like at some point you can't keep putting on this show, right? Well, it never did. It never changed. And I didn't really have the trapping bug just yet, like, or the outdoorsy thing. It was still fine. I mean, I, I was enjoying it. His passion was amazing, which was like contagious. Um, and what really actually got me was we went up to the set one time. And it had been raining and raining and raining. And the trap was kind of on a two track road, just kind of like in this, I don't want to say like valley, but like more like a, a real big dip, we'll say big dip. And all the water just kind of pulled there. Well, we got up and you could definitely see that something had been there. There was a big catch circle and everything like, and you could tell. So we got up there and he said, all right. Well, it must have pulled out, you know, and and that's one of the things of of trapping. I mean, some of you are going to be listening here and you're going to be like, oh, this animal had this on his on his foot. And I will tell you, it doesn't happen very often. Um, but every now and then, you know, you've you get this this pull out okay, where the anchor doesn't hold. And it was just because it had been raining and raining and raining and raining and raining that the anchor did not hold, the, the coyote was able to pull it out and he ran off. And my husband, boyfriend at the time, um, had looked at me and he said, well, unfortunately, I guess that's that. And I hate to sound sexist here, but being a man, you know, men do not pay attention to de detail like women do. Um, and you can even see that if you ever follow us around or ever go on a trap line together or anything like that, you'll, you'll notice Michael is, is all about speed and efficiency and getting the job done, but detail, little details are not his, his thing, you know? And, and I think that's really a man versus a woman kind of thing, but I noticed that there was this mud trail that kind of like went back into this brush and I said to him, why don't you look over there? There's this mud trail right here. So he he did. He came over and he looked and he creaked down a little bit. And lo and behold, there was our coyote. That wolf fang was stuck in between two little saplings and that, that coyote was there. And that was when things like clicked. For me that's when I got excited and it's funny because that to this day I still say that that's my first coyote and um when I actually did catch my first coyote my husband was like super excited for me and I was not as excited and he said to me he's like why are you not as excited about this and I said I already caught my first coyote <laughs> so so that was kind of how I got into trapping um but that, that doesn't nearly tell you, you know, like, why I'm where I'm at. So that's kind of where I started with it. And and I enjoyed it. And, I, and when I first started with him going out, it was really, 
I don't want to say a hobby, but it was more of a convenience thing. You know, um, I would, I would join him on the trap line whenever I could. You know, if I came up and I wanted to come along, I wasn't running a, a line on my own. It wasn't something that I was checking consistently on my own. Nothing along those lines. Um, no. And I spent a lot of time with him that first year getting information, you know, grabbing that information. And it's funny because like even his friends and stuff, you know, um, when they first met me, they're like, she is a city girl all the way. Like, <laughs> like they didn't see where the connection was going to be. It's funny because the house that I live in now, when I first came, um, I used to call it the honey cabin. Uh, cause there was dead stuff on the walls and we're in the middle of nowhere and everything. It was, that was just my, my cityness calling it the hunting cabin. But yeah, so that first year that I went out with him, I, I gathered a lot of information, you know, and I kept going back. I'm not going to lie. I kept going back to some of those like PETA videos and stuff. And, and I would ask him questions while we were out, you know, because I wasn't seeing any of this stuff. Like. I didn't understand. And then I started asking questions about, okay, so so the stuff that I'm I'm seeing in these PETA videos, and I say PETA, it wasn't just PETA, you know, any kind of like protect the wildlife videos that they put out there, but you know, obviously PETA is our our biggest competition. So I um I didn't see any of these these issues that they were portraying for us. So then I started asking, like, well, why do you really do this? Like, you know, and, and that's something that I'm sure a lot of people ask, you know, like, why do you even trap? What's the point of this? And, and he would talk to me about it. He would tell me, you know, like how mother nature is like super, super cruel. And that's, you know, it's funny because that's something I think like that people struggle with, you know, um, I think a lot of people sit there and they think, you know, like, well, God put the the animals on this planet, you know, it was their planet, you know, they're, they're good. They don't need us. And that would have been true if we didn't decide to take over the world. <laughs> um, you know, if, if we didn't have these skyscrapers and these big buildings and, and cities and all this stuff, if, if we just kind of left them alone, that would have been true, you know? Um, but but the thing is, is even with that, Mother Nature still has a really cruel way of taking care of things. You know, you got to think like fires, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes. You know, those are Mother Nature's way of of cleaning things up and and taking care of things. So so animals have the same thing, like starvation, diseases. You know, when they get overpopulated, those things really set in and they kind of take care of the animals. So anyways, he was telling me about all this stuff. And and later on that year, we caught a coyote that had some mange. And and I learned about how this this mange really just takes over and and it's a horrible way to die. And and if you don't have that that overpopulation, you know, you're still going to have a coyote here or there that has it maybe, but you know, that coyote, if you have, you have a ton of the ton of packs, a ton of population, it's going back and it's, it's spreading that mange and everything out. So, you know, with us out there trapping, it definitely helps with your population, starvation, all those things that happen. So Anyways, he was telling me about all this stuff and I thought, okay, that sounds reasonable. You know, um, I had some of the questions of like, well, you know, I know, I know hunters, they, they eat their, you know, most of the things that they kill, do you do the same thing when you trap, you know? And so that really opened up the door of all of the things that trappers use, you know, um, I was kind of under the impression at first, okay, you trapped and then now what, you know, are you doing this just for the fur? Um, and, and it really opened up to me what all you can use these animals for. You know, and I think it's really important to convey to people that, you know, these animals are not going to waste. So back to me, um, 
we had we had trapped i got my license those things and um every year you know becoming more dedicated to stuff um i still wasn't hunting at that time we would we would fish and as our relationship grew you know the the trapping the fishing those kind of things and he was making you know kind of going back to to what do you use these animals for um he was making his own baits and lures and my husband has been trapping since he was nine um really being out in the outdoors fishing hunting trapping ever since he was old enough to do it so you know he'd been he'd been making these some of them were recipes that his uncle had gotten um well not gotten but had made um some of them were recipes that he had made and he was making these things and and friends and stuff would show up so they would trade you know beer and and whatnot for these baits and lures and and they were all using them throughout the county and it was funny because I told him, I said, you know, I really think that this should become a business for you. And he said, well, why? Why would you think, you know, it's funny, whenever you start something, you're always like, well, who's going to buy it or who's going to listen, you know, just like this podcast, you know, who's going to, who's going to want to hear from me? Um, and I said to him, I go, well, I think the reason people would buy it is because I've gone to these conventions with you and I see how much money you spend and you're making your own. So I can't even, you know, imagine, and they work, you know, we've got guys coming to the house and they're hanging out and getting this stuff. And, and that's a lot of money that you're kind of wasting. Yeah. So that's how Sawmill Creek Bait and Lures came about. And then I had told him, I said, okay, well, um, you know, here, here's our business license and here's what's going on. And by the way, in a couple of weeks is your first show. So he was super excited about that. <laughs> Um, you know, we, we live right down, we live in Little Valley, New York, outside of Salamanca, and we lived right down from, still is, a, a sportsman show that they do every year in August, so we decided we were gonna, you know, get a couple things together and, and go from there, so we were in the garage, and, and at that time, we were bottling and mixing, you know, with a, with a small little blender, and pouring things with funnels and had a tiny little grinder and food processor and you know all the all the the smaller equipment that now we have upgraded from immensely but all the smaller things that we were using at that time to try to just you know get things together and that's that's kind of where we started with Sawmill Creek and it was funny because as we were going to these different conventions and I talked to more people and our name got out more and there was more of a dialogue with people that I didn't have before that were trappers and outdoorsmen and, and whatnot. I started looking around and realizing that I was probably one of the youngest people that were there. Like if you kind of took a poll of all the people who went through I was definitely one of the youngest and I was a woman. So I was in definitely in the minority of, of the people that were there. And it got me thinking, you know, why are there not more kids? I couldn't, I couldn't understand, you know, when I was a kid, yeah, there was a big gap where I, I didn't do anything outdoorsy, but, and, and I'm not saying just trapping, but like, um, there was a big gap where, you know, I didn't, I didn't fish, I didn't anything. And when I was a kid, I was all about, I wanted to do what my dad did. I wanted to do those things. I wanted to get outside and, and be with him. And I'm looking around and I'm not seeing that as much. I mean, don't get me wrong. There definitely is, is some phenomenal kids in trapping, absolutely phenomenal kids in trapping, but I wasn't seeing all that. So I was looking around and I started talking to a couple of people like, well, where are the kids at? What's going on? And I realized like, A, you've got Xbox that we're competing with. And B, um, there's a lot of funding issues. You know, um, yeah, there's a lot of great events that go that go on that help kids. But statistics show that if if the kids go home with something, they're more apt to stick with it. Um, if they 
are winning prizes at these events or if they are taking home buckets or you know the the knowledge that they're learning isn't just going to waste they have something physical in their hands and a lot of events weren't weren't able to do that just because of funding you know some of these events are mom and pops that they own a supply store and you know they're renting a porta potty and they're taking care of lunch and they're trying to put on demos and all of these things. They were doing all of these amazing things, but they didn't have the the funding to some of them to even keep going. So I started what was called Kids for Catches, and it was kind of because of Michael, really. Um, he had a woman at work who had talk to him her son had seen that mountain men program that's actually why i brought that up earlier like i never watched it as a kid or even as an adult until actually i met michael but he was watching that mountain men program and he knew about the whole trapping thing and he said you know mom i want to go see what this trapping thing's all about and she called up michael she knew he trapped and said hey will you give this a, you know will you let him go out with you and then that way maybe he won't like it and then i can not hear about it anymore and of course he went out and loved it and fell in love with it and that's all he talks about so but anyhow um i saw from him firsthand what a difference that you know taking these kids out is making what a difference having someone, you know, give them a trap, give them baits and lures, show them what they're doing really was making a difference. And I mean, as a parent, we have five kids between the two of us. And as a parent, I'm sure you could all that that are listening to this, you can relate, you know, you'd rather have your kid outside being physical and doing activities than inside playing an Xbox. So we started Kids for Catches and and it has been phenomenal. I really think that's just all we're asking for is donations, you know, baits, lures, um, things to give out to these kids at these events, you know, and Ohio is one of our, oh, the the state of Ohio, we, we do a lot with them and they have a phenomenal program that they take these kids out, they trap with them, um, you know, they... They do hands-on workshops at their conventions. So, you know, it's just phenomenal. And and you can really see the difference in in all of this. You can really see what a difference it's making having that little extra support for these events that are out there. So that's kind of how we got the whole Kids for Catches thing going on. Well, as I as being a vendor, you know, uh, I got to meet a lot of the other vendors that are out there. You know, we kind of came friends with some of them and the one wife of, of one of the other bait and lore makers, we were talking one day and she had said about, do you run your own line? And I said, no, I go out and trap with him and I hang out with him. And, you know, I, I get the experience of, of things with him, but I don't, I don't run my own line. And she was telling me about how, when she was talking to her customers, running her own line, she went out one year and ran her own line to really get the full experience so that when she was talking to them, it wasn't, it was firsthand information, not secondhand. So it wasn't like, oh, I just helped him with this. This is what he did. You can say, hey, this is what I did. And I thought that was great advice. So I decided, okay, you know what? I want to run my own line. I don't want to be my husband's pack mule anymore. Um, and I and I was really good at that. You know, I was really good at helping carrying everything and all of that. So um, I decided, you know, all right, she had a great point. So I was going to run my own line. And I told my husband this. I told him, like, I want to get out there. I want to do my own thing and everything like that. And he said, okay, no problem. He's super supportive of anything that I wanted to ever do. It's it's actually kind of like sickening how supportive he is of of all of my crazy ideas. But so I um I started looking around at these conventions. I started paying a little more attention. Now I had been going to some of the demos that were given. I had been you know paying attention to to those things, but equipment wise wasn't really anything that was important to me. And and mainly because I had him. 
you know, like everything was with my husband. So if I couldn't set a trap or if the gloves didn't fit or if I didn't have this or that or whatever, I could hand him the trap and he could set the trap and he could move on. But when I decided I was going to be out there on my own, I was like, okay, I need to, I need to get gloves that fit. I need to be able to set this trap on my own. I need to be able to do these things. So it made me start paying attention to what actually was out there for women. What, what was really going on? And I started looking at tables and what was on tables and what there was, and there was nothing. And it's funny because like as a vendor for the couple years before we started Trapping Girl, as a vendor, I never, this is going to sound pretty ignorant, but I didn't realize how many non-women there were. I didn't realize there was such a, such a divide, I guess you want to say like Nothing, nothing on those tables were for women. Nothing fit my hands. I have, I have children's hands and nothing fit my hands and nothing was made for me. And that was very frustrating and I couldn't understand why. But then whenever I started paying attention to more, well, the reason why was because there weren't a lot of women that went to these things. There weren't a lot of women when you were talking that were out there trapping. I mean, there are some. There are some absolutely phenomenal women who are in trapping, who have been trapping all their life. You know, some some have started since they were a child. Some of them started in their 20s. Some of them, you know, started a little more recent, but before me. And there are some phenomenal women in trapping. But there was nothing made for those women, you know? Um, and the funny thing is, is I think because some of those women started when they were so young, they adapted a lot easier to men's tools, men's gloves, men, you know, like the man side of things, they were able to adapt because they grew up that way where me, who I didn't grow up that way. It was harder for me. It was a lot more difficult. And it was, it was very frustrating for my husband because especially like setting a trap, him realizing like, okay, she's going to need setters because for him, it was like, just do it, Linda, just, just figure it out, just do it. And that wasn't me. So he got everything together for me. He was super supportive, got everything together that he thought that I would need, you know, all the things that he had used out on the line when we were together, we got all this stuff in a bag and he said, okay, there you go. And it was time for me to run my own, my own line. And I got to my very first set and I had this bag that weighed like 50 some pounds. And I was like, this is stupid. <laughs> I was exhausted. I was tired. Um, I was frustrated because things just, you know, I had these heavy hammers and I had, you know, all these things that when you have your husband really helping you and doing this stuff for you, it wasn't a big deal, but it was to me at that point. So I decided, all right, I wanted to, I wanted to have a business that was going to cater towards women because I knew that if I was having these struggles, other women were having these struggles as well. I wasn't the only one. And I thought to myself, you know, I wonder if this was the reason why there was such fewer women in traffic. If this was the reason why we, we didn't see those numbers, you know, they weren't going to the conventions because there was nothing there for them. You know, they, they were, oh yeah, no big deal. I'll, I'll ride along with my husband. I enjoy hanging out with him or whatever, but it wasn't a real big interest for them because it was frustrating. You know, it was frustrating for me. I had kind of adapted on the whole riding along thing and, and being a part of things, you know, to help him. But whenever I was doing it on my own, that was, that was a whole different story. So I called up a, a gentleman, Trevor Barnes, and he is a, is a supply dealer and a fur buyer in Michigan. And I had previously, you know, had a friendship that, that was with him and his wife. And I had called him up and I said, what do you think about 
trying to get something that would be for women in trapping. And he said, okay, Linda, I'm intrigued. Let's talk more about this. So I told him all of my frustrations that I had and see, and I talked to him because he was already a, a supply dealer. So, you know, he was one of those people that didn't have all that other extra stuff on the table, or if he did have that extra stuff on the table, it wasn't laid out where women knew what it was or that it was designed towards them. It's funny because, so the setters that I have are pretty much on 90% of the, the supply dealers tables that are out there. All right. Um, the difference that, that are on my table is that we paint them and we stick them on the trap. So people know what the heck they are. Um, that's the only, only difference, but there's tons of people out there who had no clue what they were. You know, they didn't understand that these products were out there. They didn't understand what was going on, you know? And so women, they didn't know to ask, you know, hey, do you have a two pound hammer? Do you have this? Do you have that? Is there a bag that I could use? Like they didn't know to ask these things because it wasn't, and, I, and I'm not trying to diminish anybody, but it, it wasn't laid out in a way like, these are the different sizes. These are the different things. These can help you. They're just kind of thrown on the table and and they weren't displayed in a way where it was easier for women to detect, you know, and, and gloves, for instance, I am probably the only person who sells a small pair of gloves. So, but anyhow, touch Trevor, we got things going. And then that's how Trapping Girl came about. And it was crazy because it ended up not just becoming a business. It became a community, you know, and it was, I was talking earlier about how my husband's excitement, you know, it's contagious. Well, that was the same thing, you know, supporting other women, supporting um, other girls and kids and all of that, you know, it it's become contagious through all of us, you know, not just me, but through all of us. Like, you know, we post pictures and, you know, support each other and all of those things like that has become contagious and it's become more of a community than it has a just oh this person's trapping or that person's trapping so so that's kind of how I got from point a to point b and and who I am and and with the whole community thing like I said I'm now writing a column with the American trapper that's supporting women in trapping that's highlighting women in trapping you know, I do a lot of things with Kids for Catches that are with the different organizations to help support those kids in trapping, to help um, let them know that there's something else out there than than video games. And, you know, you're learning life skills and all of that. So all of these things kind of kind of fell in. And it's funny how you don't realize you're missing something in your life until you have it. And then you're like, wow. I was missing that all along, like, because this becomes such an important thing for me. So that's kind of who I am. And, and it definitely has become who I am. There, there really isn't much in my life anymore that isn't surrounded by the outdoors. And, and I am hunting now and I'm hunting now because I will say that's probably one of the best things that came out of COVID. When, when all of that COVID stuff started uh, two years ago, I guess, we're on almost on year three now. Um, I really understood. I'm not a, I'm not a meat person. I'm not a, a red meat girl. Okay. That's just not my thing. Um, but when COVID hit, I started realizing like the importance of, of the trapping skills that I had and of the fishing skills that I had. And I said, you know what? The, the whole, gardening and the whole hunting, I really need to, to hone those skills. You know, I need to be okay with that. And, and dispatching whenever you're, you're trapping, you know, I felt that I was then prepared to hunt without having to worry about, you know, burying a squirrel in the backyard. So then, you know, so that kind of brings us up to where we are now and who I am and, and what drives me 
and and where I'm at with things. So why do this podcast? <laughs> right? You know, I've got all these things going on. So so why do this podcast? Why why start that? Well, there was a couple of reasons why I decided to do this podcast and and really the direction that I wanted to take it in. The first was when I started writing for the American Trapper and listening to all of these stories, there was a woman that I had wrote about. Um, her name is Val. And and she's actually going to do, she already agreed to be one of the guests on this this podcast. So you'll hear from her. But she her story, and I'll let her tell it to you, but her story, when I was writing it, did not do it justice. Me writing it out did not do it justice as hearing it from her, as hearing the passion that she had. And I feel like there's a lot to be said with hearing things firsthand. You know, the 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 raw version of what's really going on, hearing it for that person, I think is, is amazing. Like there's just definitely something to be said by that. And the other reason, you know, so she was a big, she was a big thing in my head of, of why, why add another podcast? I mean, there's, there's all these outdoor podcasts, there's all these different things, you know, that she was a big thing you know, a big reason why I decided to start. And the other one was I was on a podcast and, and I've, I've done a couple of these. I've never thought that I would do one on my own, but I have been a guest on, on quite a few of them. And someone had asked me if you ever had advice to give to, to an outdoorsman, what would your number one advice be? And I told them, I said, whether it's fishing, trapping, hunting, whatever you're doing, sit down and talk to someone. That actual like hearing it from someone else's voice, like is amazing. And I, and I guess, you know, like that's no different than YouTube. This is no different than YouTube. Um, but that just like, that is what I, I would tell you to do. And I get that. I get that. You can't always do that. You can't always be face to face with somebody. So my thought was, you know, <sighs> there's a lot of issues that are out there. There's a lot of stories to be told. And there's a lot of issues that are out there that are facing the outdoor community right now. The trapping, the hunting, the, the anglers. There's a lot of issues that are, that are facing all of us. And the more that I talk on these podcasts and the more that I talk to groups and I get in front of, you know, different events and everything else, you know, um, I've noticed the divide. I've noticed that, you know, we kind of all stay in our own lane, you know, and that hurts us. That really does. It hurts us whenever we stay in our own lane, you know, when you're going into battle, the first thing they tell you is like divide and conquer. You know, that's the, that's the best way to win a fight, divide and conquer. So, you know, the best thing for, for antis and, and government officials or, or whatever to get rid of, of trapping and, and fishing and hunting and all of these outdoor things, um, the best way for them to do is divide, divide and conquer. Right. So, and and unfortunately, trapping is an easy target. You know, um, people think of trapping as, as as movies. You know, they think of those those big huge traps with teeth and everything like that, on which is is totally untrue. You know, and they think of these animals as like Disney creatures. So they think of you know that little sweet little otter that's you know gonna pick you a flower and give it to you or whatever. They don't think of that otter that has, you know, that kills just to kill because otters do, they will, you know, kill a carp, take a bite and throw it up on the bank and go down and kill another carp and, and so on and so on. So, and that's something that they don't, they don't tell you, they don't talk about, you know, everything is a Disney animal or it's, it's like it is in the movies and that's not correct. So we're an easy target. 
because we can be manipulated. Um, what we're doing can be manipulated and it can make it look into something that it's not, you know, and thank God, like I said, you know, when I started, I could have believed all that stuff. I could have believed the manipulations that they gave me. Um, I didn't obviously, but I could have. And yes, trapping because of that, because it's easy to be manipulated. It is easier for them to be a target for, for trappers to be a target. The thing is though, something that we all need to be paying attention to is that we are not going to be the only targets for us as outdoorsmen, outdoors women, to, to stand together. But you're not going to stand together with something that you don't understand. So my thought was, is with this podcast, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to talk about all the things that we don't understand why we're so divided, where we are with things, you know, and somebody told me, you know, that's, that's kind of uh, somebody from PETA who's listening to this, and then they're going to use that against you, you know, like somebody had said that to me once. And I said, my response back was, I hope they're listening and show them, listen, we're okay. You don't need to be fighting against us. You know, so I'm not worried about who might be listening. I hope something, somebody actually is listening. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the whole purpose behind this. Um, and it is to support women in the outdoors. It is to get their point of view. And, and one of the main reasons why a lot of my guests, not all of my guests, but a lot of my guests will be women is because we are a target. And I hate to say it that way, but, um, a few years ago, I had become the poster child for PETA and they had a, a picture of me that they gosh blasted all over the place and, and made me out to be a serial killer. You know, honestly, that's what their whole goal was and, and that's fine, but they did, they, they blasted my picture everywhere. And I learned, I can, it's funny because I actually ended up a friending one of the, um, antis and had a discussion with them and now they're not an anti anymore but that's okay that's a whole nother story but that's actually one of the tactics they use is they go after women because women we are supposed to be sweet and loving and caring and so any woman who would want to be out hunting and fishing and trapping and doing all of these things must be crazy right you know, so many of them think that this is a good old boys club. You know, only only those men could go out and be so barbaric. What I think so many people don't realize is that a lot of what we're doing is not barbaric. It's it's not. Um, so that was the whole thing. I thought, you know what, I really want to, I don't want to sugarcoat things. I, I want to have guests on here where you're going to learn about what they're doing but also learn of their point of view of what exactly they're doing. Not necessarily just who they are, but what exactly they're doing. We're going to have, like I said, Val. She She's a cat trapper. And she has only been cat trapping for about three years now. She's only been trapping for about three years now. You know, and it started out as a, a predation on her ranch and, and moved from there. And so we're going to learn about, like, why did... Why as a rancher did you decide that this was something that was going to be good for you? We're going to talk to a woman who she tracks. She's very big into tracking animals and she can tell you their patterns and what's going on. You know, we're going to talk to hunters. We're going to talk to fishermen, all of these different things and talk about why they got into this, you know, and how as trapper, fishermen, hunters, and so on, we all have a part in the world together and why we are so very needed, why each one of those are so very vital to this world. You know, and that's the thing I think that people don't understand. You know, there's there's so many people out there who are are fighting against us, you know, let's ban trapping, let's ban hunting, let's ban fishing. They're trying to take away rights. They're trying to do this because they're worried so much of the rights of the animal and everything else. But 
they don't realize the effect that that's taking. They don't realize what that outcome is going to be until they take those rights away and then it's going to be too late. You know, I use I use California as as an example. You know, they they banned trapping in in California. You were not to be trapping in California. And not even hours later, they spent $10 million because they have beaver problems. That makes no sense to me. <laughs> Can someone explain that to me? That makes absolutely no sense. Why would you why would you ban something that was bringing money into into your state? You know, because trappers we pay we pay to have a license, you know, we pay for these courses and everything else. Why would you ban something to turn around and spend money on the very same thing you banned? Like things like that doesn't make sense to me. But we're going to talk about that because we are going to, the, the whole point is to try to get everyone on the same page. I'm not saying everybody needs to be a trapper. I'm not saying everybody needs to be a hunter. I'm not saying that everybody needs to be to be an angler. That's not the that's not the case at all. You just need to physically understand what is going on. And maybe hearing it from my point of view is not what you need. But maybe hearing it from Val's point of view is what you need. Maybe hearing it from the DEC is what you need. What their side of things are. You know, there it's I think it's funny how um, we sometimes get these PETA people who are on post or social media and everything, and they will sit there and say, oh, you killed that animal. I hope you die. They were more worried about protecting that animal that they thought that you harmed, which you didn't. I mean, not in the way that they're thinking you harmed them. They're more worried about that animal than they are about other human beings. How is that correct? Why is that correct? Why is that socially acceptable? So things like that is are we're, what we're going to talk about, where we're going to go with this. Um, next week, you can tune in. Um, we're going to have a one of my favorite people on here. Um, actually, I'm going to Nebraska here soon, so hopefully she will say yes if not maybe she won't be on but hopefully she's listening to this so this is going to guilt her to to be on but um she had been trapping for most of her life and i really think that that's important to hear her side of things you know and where she's at like she's in the state of nebraska and they don't have a season on coyotes because it has just become such a problem and that's something that we need to to recognize as well so anyhow, um, that's who I am, what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. Hopefully you'll tune in. This isn't going to be the last time you hear from me. And I really appreciate it. I wanted to give a shout out to Adrian Romero. He has Romero Fine Arts. He is one of our sponsors along with um, Barnes, Hyde & Fur, Trevor Barnes. If you go on his website, you will be able to see the different um fur routes and everything else. I know right now, you know, fur fur prices have been kind of ridiculous. <laughs> um and 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 fur routes have closed down. Trevor is still running fur routes. So it would be a good one to to look at. You know, of course look at Sawmill Creek Baits and Lures at www.sawmillcreekbaitandlures.com. Um you've got full predator and and different bait and lure lines that are there. And then trapping girl you know um we will have some other sponsors hopefully that that come on board but yeah right now that's where we're at with things and i want to say thank you all for listening thank you for tuning in um hopefully this isn't the last time you tune in i i hope that you follow me on this journey you know that you get to experience the different guests and different points of view that we will have on this and, um, oh, I wanted to also say, so I have an email. It is questions for TG at gmail.com. So it's just questions for TG at gmail.com. If you're listening and you want to hear from somebody, maybe there's somebody you're following on social media and you 
you'd love to hear their point of view and their side of things. Or maybe you have some questions for me or for, for another guest that's been on the show or will be on the show, you know, send me that stuff out. Something that you're dealing with, something with it you're struggling with. You know, we can even pick some guests off of some struggles that we have trappers have or questions that we have. So, and not just trappers, obviously, you know, anglers, hunters, all of you, um, send those questions in, send those ideas, send those thoughts, send those, those communications in, you know, reach out to us. I would love, love, love to hear from all of you. Um, give me some fan mail. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much. Stay safe and we'll see you next week. Bye.